I tell our students, don't come if you're not curious and open to be inspired to a different perspective on yourself and the world. Hello, and welcome to season two of Conversations on Climate, the podcast series which has been developed in partnership with the London Business School's Alumni Energy Club, which have been leading a series of conversations with experts from around the world exploring the biggest challenge of our time, climate change. Within that community of world-leading opinion formers, a wide range of ideas and solutions to global climate and environmental issues have been discussed and explored in depth. To kick off season two, we continue our conversation with the leading lights of the community with London Business School's Dean and CEO, Francois Ortello Magne. The Dean is an economist by background, having been tenured faculty before taking on the role as Dean of Wisconsin Business School. Francois has been Dean of London Business School since 2017. We had a fascinating conversation and one you won't want to miss. Around 80% of people who listen to this podcast haven't hit the follow button. If I could ask you for a small favor, if you do enjoy our conversations, please do hit that follow button on your app. It would help us in the show more than I could possibly say. Thank you and enjoy the conversation. Francois, thank you so much for inviting us into your wonderful home here on uh, you know, the Dean's House in uh-huh. uh, Regent's Park. It's a great honour and privilege that you could take the time to come and speak to us. Our pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. So if we could just start by, uh, if you give us a little bit of flavour of your, your journey so far. Like, how did you, like, how are you sitting in this chair now speaking to us? <laughs> um, yeah, well, right now, the, the, uh, the main part of my journey that got me here is, I was the Dean at the Wisconsin School of Business at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And uh, credit to London Business School and its governors, they worked with the head on being very specific about what they were looking for in their next leader. And then the head on apparently went around the world asking, do you know someone with those attributes? And apparently my name uh, came up a few times. And, and so it's a real privilege, uh, and I wish it to everybody, uh, to be hired into a job where um, from what the employer tells you, you are the puzzle piece that matches the puzzle gap uh, that uh, they were looking for. So yes, I was a dean prior to being here, and before that I was a a professor of real estate. I started my academic career in economics at the London School of Economics. Mm -hmm. Very good. But of course you weren't a a complete stranger to London Business School. Uh, You you visited Yeah, yeah, I had a visiting stint here, although it didn't work exactly as planned. The idea was I got a grant from ESRC to do research, so no teaching, and I thought, let's get out of LSE and go to LBS and I can spend my time there and do the research. And my wife and I thought we were really smart to plan to have a baby at the same time. Um, And then we had twins uh, with no family in town. So um, the truth is I didn't spend too much time in the office at LBS during that uh, visiting stint. Uh, I spent a lot of time uh, helping uh, two wonderful children get started with their life. (laughs) (laughs) Very good, very good. And uh, you mentioned your background was in uh, in, in land economics and so uh-huh. and uh, you came from originally from, from the Pyrenees. Your connection with the lands like, was that a part of your your kind of your rural background in uh-huh. the French Pyrenees? Uh-huh. And where, where, where did that, that kind of passion come from that you wanted uh, to dedicate your academic career to? It? So I don't know that I know where it came from. Probably has something to do with the fact that my grandfather was a farmer and his whole family uh, before him. My parents are both agricultural engineers. Um, And at the age of six, I told them I wanted to be a farmer. Um, But if you don't inherit a farm, which it didn't go to my father, it went to my uncle. Um, I went to Kansas and I found a wife, but she didn't have a farm. She was actually from Colorado. So if you don't marry in a farm, it's really hard to be a farmer. Um, And so I stayed in school and I did agricultural engineering and then I did a PhD and then I became a professor. <laughs> and at this point, my PhD, I thought, well, let me do some research relative to, to farming. So I, I worked on uh, uh, farmland markets. Uh, but then when I graduated, my uh, PhD advisor told me, you know, you're passionate about this, but very few people in the world are. And did you notice that your research applies to housing? And, you know, a lot more people care about housing. So you might consider, if you want to have impact as a researcher, you might consider shifting your interest from uh, farmland markets uh, Subtle. to housing. <laughs> and um, he was right. Uh, the paper that came out of that still gets cited. It was a good advice. But it comes from that. It comes from my family. And, and uh, yeah, I, 
I really wanted to be a farmer. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, though obviously the world of agriculture and, and housing, we are mm -hmm. both are very much impacted by, yeah. by climates yes. uh, these days. And you know, like going back to the, the, the Pyrenees, uh, Pyrenees has had um, for 1.2 degrees of warming, which is like significantly higher than, than, than it, other parts of the world. It's actually awful yeah. what's going on because the, there are predictions that say the glaciers will have disappeared by 2050. Yeah. But one of the main glaciers where I like to go hiking by the Vignemal, it's the highest French peak. Um, that glacier has lost two meters of ice every year for the past 20 years, except last year it lost four and a half meters. There's only 35 meters left. So I don't know that it will last until 2050. And it's completely changing the, uh, the mountain and it's changing the whole ecosystem uh, there. Mm -hmm. So, so particularly <laughs> this summer when the, the melt was more than twice the uh, annual normal melt, I mean normal, abnormal, <laughs> but regular melt, uh, it has become very alarming. And it's difficult to have any hope actually, because it's not like we're gonna start putting white covers over the glaciers in the, in the summer. So yes, it is, um, it is very concerning. And that's why I like the fact that, I mean, I like, no, uh, but I appreciate the fact that more and more we hear conversations about not just climate change, but climate emergency. Mm -hmm. And that I think can only help. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. The, the use of language is really very important. Mm -hmm. the, the, the movement from um, global warming to climate change was a very politically oriented uh -huh. move. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. very, yeah, yeah. And I think moving it now to climate emergency mm -hmm. does it, it gets people react differently and emotionally react differently. Yeah. Now, moving from um, Wisconsin, um, where you're noted for doing some really uh, fantastic mm -hmm. work, and then you come to London Business yeah. School. This, 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 there's some very big shoes to, to fill uh -huh, there, fill, to fill yeah. there from, from, from <laughs> Sarah Saranjo, who we spoke to, uh -huh. to as well. Um, what's kind of brought you to, to wish to take on that level of, uh -huh. of, of challenge? You know, it's, it, it's one of the biggest seats in, uh -huh. in academics. Yep. Yeah. Probably it is, actually, mm. if you look in terms of the prestige mm. and the potential for impact. Uh, there's a very few academic positions that can rival with, with this one. And so it starts from the foundation as to why is it I wanted to become a leader in academia. And you know, I had a career myself as a teacher and a, as a researcher, but remember about wanting to be a farmer. And, and the farmer is not the one that pulls the corn from the ground or, or pushes the milk out of the cow. No, no, the farmer is the one who creates an environment where plants and animals can flourish. And, and I, saw, I saw academic leadership as an opportunity to actually fulfill that long-time dream to be that farmer, to be the one who, who creates an environment for great faculty to do research, for great students to interact with one another and, and with the faculty, and for alumni network to engage uh, uh, with their school. And so, so that's why I first applied for the job at uh, Wisconsin. And then the, the call to LBS, I like the fact that LBS is a world-class research institution where the researchers are passionate about their impact. Um, and why that? Because I believe as a society, we have drifted into a, a corner that's a big issue for all of us, and maybe we are warming up to this problem. It's, it's the fact that because we have dropped the public funding into uh, scientific and academic research, we are no longer creating an environment where a few selected people who have proved themselves, tenure process is a very long process, are given the right to curiously wander at the frontier of knowledge. And to give you a concrete example, why it is a big loss is if I look at the faculty who are relevant today to the climate uh, debate, you know, you talk to some of our faculty uh, here, it's not because once we said it's a climate emergency, I started doing research on this. It's because years ago, before anyone thought this would become an emergency, they were asking themselves questions that today we know are relevant. And there is no dean <laughs> who could have told them 15 years ago, 20 years ago, oh, you got to start working on, you know, no, that would have never happened. What happened is they were trained, they were selected, and they were incentivized to have impact, and somehow they had figured out that, hey, st stuff is moving. And so to give you a concrete example, when I got to LBS, I decided to read one to two papers for every tenure tenure track faculty member, so 105 of them. And I found out that Actually, unbeknownst to them, there were 17 of them 
who in the previous five years had published 46 papers related to questions of diversity and inclusion across every one of our subject areas. So in every domain, not just in our behavior, but also in economics and accounting. Yeah? Mm -hmm. That would not have happened if someone has said, do this. No, it's because they care about that impact that somehow they were ahead. And I have yet to encounter in my six years uh, as a dean a real world issue of the moment that doesn't have someone who had been worrying about it for many years. And what I love about LBS is that we are trying to figure out a way to create an environment for this kind of curious wondering but with no public funding or very little, no big endowment. So it means we have to be relevant. There has to be a thread from every one of the researchers to the teaching of our students and the teaching of executive education. And that means that even the monks themselves, I don't have to tell them, while we can create an environment with a lot of individual freedom for those researchers, they're curious wondering, we have a real sense of collective responsibility. And it's what I think is unique uh, at LBS is that Somehow over the years, we have assembled a group of people to whom we have given that freedom <laughs> to be brilliant, but they realize that collectively they have to be impactful. And that is why today we have so many researchers who are relevant to the issues of the day. And you know what? Tomorrow, bring on the issue, I bet you there'll be someone. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I love at, at LBS is we create this platform, this curious wondering. And then with that, of course, we attract amazing students from around the world. And then they go out and they amplify the impact of that research of ours. We attract amazing corporate clients. They go out and amplify the impact of, of that research. And we are in a position to provide the content and the connections our alumni needs for, for, for today now and, and for their tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, since you've been uh, Dean, you have uh, relaunched the brand uh -huh. and you've been um, undertaking kind of a strategy of, mm -hmm. of transformation. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit, what, what's your, your, your vision going, like, for uh -huh. going forward? Obviously, it's a wonderful place. Mm -hmm. where, where, where do we need to be, to be going? Uh -huh. So first, if I can go back to the, the relaunching the brand. Yeah. Uh, it is a standard word. I would say maybe I focused uh, the brand. Um, you know, we, we love our diversity at LBS, and I think it, maybe it had become a bit confusing. Uh, and so, so, so we did this really interesting work, leveraging our, our faculty and their research on who is it we have been. Like, if we look at our archives, our history, and also we ask ourselves, like, who really defines our brand? You know, and pointing out to ourselves that there's something special about our alumni. Because once an alum, forever an alum. Right? I, I wear a lapel pin, but you might as well get a tattoo because <laughs> it doesn't change, right? So, so, so what is it that they tell us they are? And who is it they aspire to be? And so, so this allowed us to, to, I guess, focus on some well-known cornerstones of our brand, uh, which research, the international diversity, and the fact that the programs we do, they're about having a profound impact. So we, we're not just here to give you knowledge. We're here to, to help you gain a new perspective on yourself and, and on the world. So that was important. The other element was uh, I wanted to meet the alumni community. I mean, like I said, they defined the brand. So I went around the world in my uh, first several months. And you know, we had this sentence in the school that we want to have a profound impact on the way the world does business. But as I was talking with alumni around the world, I was like, no, wait a minute, this is too short. I'm hearing more, and I don't remember exactly how when it happened, but at some point, having taken, spent a day with alumni, I was giving a speech that night, and I said, you know, we want to have a profound impact on the way the world does business, but also on the way business impacts the world. And it, it seemed to resonate, and so at the next speech, I said it again. And this, this sentence took a life of its own, because it actually captured, in a way, that evolution of our community, that yes, we want to have an impact and a profound impact on the way the world is business and on the way business impacts the world. And so if you want that, that relaunch, it was be clear as to what is essential about who we are in identity, that, that research, that international diversity, diversity, and then this profound impact that we have. But then let's be clear that this profound impact is it's, it's impact on the way the world does business. And I like to think about impact squared is impact on the way business impacts the world. Impact on impact, impact squared. French love math. What <laughs> I so so that, that's how we started, right? Uh, and then we ask ourselves, 
on the strength of our history, given what's happening in the times in terms of competition, but also uh, what we see our alumni need for their future, what's the best thing we can do? And, and, and you, know the, you know this, the world has changed. I mean, you're contributing to this change. It's no longer I'm born, I'm educated, I work for the same company, and then I die. No, <laughs> the world is changing around me. I need to continue to educate, to continue to find the connection I need for, for tomorrow. And, and I know, like, WhatsApp is a fierce competitor. Our, our students come out of here, our executive participants with great WhatsApp group, and they tell me how active they are on these WhatsApp groups. But, but those are the connections they made when they were here. And for all I know, once they move to a different city, different industry, there's probably some people who are not on their WhatsApp group on someone else's WhatsApp group. It would be really important for them to understand who they are. And so that's why we ask ourselves, can, can we not just think of education as a transaction, you pay tuition and then you get a diploma, but really education, a degree in particular, as an onboarding into a community, and then we remain relevant uh, for you forever after, because that's the way the world is changing anyway. And so, so it's not my vision, it's about me trying to articulate who we are, that, that research, that diversity, having that profound impact, impact square, and what is the best way to serve that collective purpose that we have? And, and I saw an opportunity that is, uh, let's not just do transactions, but a repeat engagement. And that's why our vision, we state it as wanting to be an engaged community, walking a learning journey together. Mm -hmm. And that's what we are trying to, to achieve. Mm -hmm. Grant, which is a very nice transition onto, mm -hmm. onto the, the, the current campaign. Mm -hmm. Like Forever Forward, a very mm -hmm. ambitious uh, £200 mm -hmm. million pound campaign you, you've recently launched. Could you tell us a little bit about it? First, I must say, I appreciate you calling it ambitious. It, that's nice. There are days when I look at our US competition and it's tough because you see many of our competitors, actually, they have endowments that are so big they could shut down all operations and still fund themselves. It's stunning that we're able to compete with them in many ways, and that says a lot about our people. Uh, and at the same time, I hope it's an inspiration that there's something great for us to do, building on our uh, track record. But so what are the 200 million about? They're about accelerating that transformation of ours toward that vision of an engaged community walking the learning uh, journey together. So it starts with the makeup of the community. Um, I guess I would say Black Lives Matter was a big wake-up call. Uh, for our school. We've prided ourselves for a long time, and rightly so, in the international diversity of our community. And, and I love it when an American dean asks me, what's the proportion of foreigners? Like, first of all, they're always going to lose, because for us it's 91%. But the fact that you ask me that statistic tells me you don't understand. Because what, what's fascinating at LBS is that if we gave a flag to everybody for the nationalities that are relevant to their lives, we would spend so much on flags. Right? Because there's so many people who have more than one country relevant to their life. So, so, so I like the fact that actually the competition doesn't even understand the, the metric of the, of the race. So we're very proud of that. And that is something to be celebrated and to be continued. But Black Lives Matter helped us realize that there's some other dimension of diversity in which we must do better. We knew we had to push on gender. We knew that already. But with Black Lives Matter, we realized that from a point of view of ethnic and racial diversity, and also socioeconomic diversity, we were way behind in ways that were unacceptable. And I would give credit to the black students at the time to step up and not only just, just call out the issue in a very visceral way that created a shift in the community, but also be the first architect of the change. And I'm delighted with the momentum that, that uh, we have uh, now. So a key element of the campaign, the number one priority from a financial perspective, is doubling our scholarships. Because it's, it's with scholarship that we're going to be able to eliminate barriers to entry into world-class business education. We have good momentum. We have demonstrated, particularly to a foundation that's not an alumni foundation, that we could identify candidates who are not in the pool. So our scholarship are not just going to fight the ones who are going to go to Wharton or Stanford anyway, but to identify other people. And at the same time, we have raised money for scholarships to help us fight the best schools in the world so we can keep pushing for outstanding a talent. And that's the number one priority, is bring outstanding talent with greater diversity uh, in our school. A uh, second priority that, that's relevant, I think, to our whole community is around our innovation agenda. Moving to be in a position to walk the learning journey together with individuals, but also with corporates, it requires a different infrastructure than we have had in the past. 
yeah, the ability to do predictive modeling. So we, we can actually be ahead and say, you know, this is, this is what you could use right now. To remove the happenstance factor that, ah, oh, as a dean, I happen to bump into someone into the pizza business in Australia, one in Canada, one in Saudi Arabia, and, oh, I'm going to make the connection. No, 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 can we just... And we know this can be there, right? So innovation is about giving ourselves this infrastructure to have much more personalized content in that scale. Mm. Now, infrastructure is not just the digital world, it's also the physical environment. And we really believe in London as our, as our hub. Uh, over the years, we have developed a great presence in, in Dubai. And uh, we think that can be enriched so that those spaces can really be places where people connect and collide and ideas are exchanged and perspectives are shifted. And then the final priority is the foundational to all of this. Uh, we start already talking about this and I appreciate how much you've engaged our researchers. Is we are not LBS if, if we are not relying on proper academic research and science, if we don't understand the causality of things. And we are not LBS in 10 years if today we don't create a space where world-class researchers can do whatever they want that curious wondering. So that's our priorities. It's, it's scholarship, it's innovation, it's learning environment, and then it's research. The, the conversations on climate have kind of evolved over mm -hmm. time, I'm not just talking about this mm -hmm. series, but in general, mm -hmm. um, to, be, to be taking on these much broader ideas mm -hmm. of you know, justice and diversity, as, mm -hmm. as, uh, as you're, mm -hmm. you're, you're uh, very much bringing up here. So it's fantastic to see that at, at the mm -hmm. core of our mm -hmm. board. Um, what do you feel uh, is brought into the classroom by having additional um, diversity and then post-classroom mm -hmm. uh, after uh, from the experience of people mm -hmm. coming in and having and having all of these these, these mm -hmm. extra thoughts uh, then going out into the world of leadership What's, mm -hmm. so how do you think that benefits the LBS alumni of the future so I, I tell our students don't come if you're not curious and open to be inspired to a different perspective on yourself and the world. And the way we deliver on this promise is at least as much your classmates as it is the faculty. The best the faculty can do is to create a framework and a space for exchange. The kind of exchange that's going to make you realize that, oh, there is a different way of looking at the world than my way of looking at the world. And Maybe it's something I can learn and I can benefit from. Another thing is fundamental to the kind of education we want to deliver that's going to serve people here and serve them in the world, to put, open them up to different perspectives. Now, that's what you see to the individual experience. If, if you were to look at the school from a more macro perspective, you will see how our clubs evolve over time. So I'll give you a very concrete example. Once we open ourselves to the fact that um, we are doing very poorly in terms of ethnic and racial diversity in particular. Very little representation of uh, black people in our faculty and our students. The student asked me, what, what's the best we can do on this? And I said, well, let's break that. But can you please feel a movement that break other barriers? Right? And it's on the back of Black Lives Matter and the action of the students that the students by themselves created a club they call FLY for first generation low and intermediate income students. That doesn't happen if you don't already, have, don't already have the seeds of diversity and create the environment, in this case, the faculty and the administration. And, and, and when that happens from the students, you can easily imagine the, the power it has compared to if the dean says, I also want the club. Also because in the UK, we don't have a federal form like, like is available in the US that gives us a sense of who uh, is at the different levels of socio-economic uh, capacities, in particular financial, right? So unless something is start, like that is started from the ground up and the students self-identify, um, there's not much we can do. The consequence of that is that, for example, some of the best experiential learn learning that happens or some of the social activities that the students organize for themselves, now there are options that don't cost much or don't cost anything at all. They did that. Without us of having that, that seeds of diversity and then creating an environment that is inclusive, that doesn't happen. And I think you can easily imagine that the power this has when it comes bottom up mm -hmm. than when it comes from the top. Absolutely. And uh, in my experience, when I first adjo I joined the Alumni mm -hmm. Country Club, like um, too many years ago, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> 
um, the leadership were a very strong majority from mm -hmm. uh, from from traditional industries because mm -hmm. that was just that okay. was, it wasn't that was the yeah. way though, that was the way the, the alumni base mm -hmm. were and tapping into into that. Now there is I, the last person who was within kind of mm -hmm. traditional mm -hmm. you know, extraction industries has moved out into consultancy and he's a green energy consultant now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's it's now entirely yeah. tran transformed from, uh -huh. from that the alumni club. But also more notably, it, well, or equally as notably, the energy club, the student energy club, mm -hmm. is now the energy and sustainability club. There you go. So it's so like the, the, yeah. the, the people have, the people have spoken. <laughs> yeah. And see, we very much believe in creating an environment where diverse minds can connect and collide. And I know it sounds like marketing speech, and that's where it comes from. But the fact is, we make it real. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and, and I like the fact that actually in our community, people know how to have those collisions of ideas, mm -hmm. rather than fist fights or legal fights. No, no, it's like, okay, let's engage with the content. And that is something really special, actually, uh, at LBS. And you see it in the diversity of the student. For them, you see it in how much everyone enjoys these electives, where we have students of different generations <laughs> together, from the pre-experience to the exec MBAs in the Sloan. And yes, in the classroom, there are students who could be the parents of the others, right? But, but they learn from one another. Imagine a class about digital disruption, where you have the 45-year-old and the 22-year-old, right? And so, so so that's what, that's what we do here. And, but it starts from that curiosity, that openness, and it just makes you realize that, wow, this has a huge payoff. Mm -hmm. And if you can take that for the rest of your life, remain curious and open, we've done our job. Right. And taking it back to, to climate um, mm -hmm. and, and you know, the, the wonderful ideas of having more uh, gender diversity, mm -hmm. more people from the uh, ge geographic south, mm -hmm. um, how do you see that as feeding into the, into the climate conversation on, on, on campus? We have people from enough countries around the world and enough industries that I bet uh, we probably very comprehensive representation of different perspectives uh, here. And I'm glad that we can create a safe and educational environment where people can voice their opinion mm -hmm. and then maybe shift them over time. One thing that's interesting is that um, I've been very clear, and this is a message that has been heard by the students, that the alumni are our brand. So I can tell you that there are students who also internalize this and say, okay, wait a minute. We all come in with all kinds of different diverse perspectives, but are we okay with every perspective being represented when we come out? Or is there some element that we should learn? And, you know, the, uh, unfortunately, climate, it has become so politicized. I think some of my colleagues have talked with you about the fact it's become so emotional. And, but on the other hand, another one of our academics told you, you know, science is science. <laughs> 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 we can argue about gravity, but if I drop the glass, it drops. Yeah. Uh, and so, so, so hopefully some of that happens as well in the classroom, and I think what we can be a place, hopefully, uh, London Business School, in particular because research is such a foundation to, to who we are, where we help people understand causality from correlation and from alternative truths and facts, and, and we help them understand the, the power of basing your reasoning on evidence, right? Because that, that shows up in the content of what we teach, but also in, in, in how is it that, that we teach an approach. So hopefully, this is happening in our school and uh, out of the wonderful diversity that we come in there are some elements where actually we've we've created some boundaries that help people in the rest of their life and just back to forever forward for a moment um forever forward it's a it's obviously a forward looking mm -hmm. you know a, um, yep. you know a positive um message um for anything to be to last the test of time Mm -hmm. uh, you need to have an element of sustainability mm -hmm. within it. Yeah. Um, have you kind of built the ideas and concepts of sustainability mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. uh, forever? It does seem to be implied. Yeah, in yeah, there, yeah. yeah. No, that's where, where, where does it come out? Yeah. Good catch. <laughs> uh, absolutely. And uh, I'll tell you, the, the one shift that's happening in the school as we speak uh, right now is, um, as I mentioned, because, because we care about our impact, because we're in tune with the world around us, because of our collective commercial responsibility, um, yeah, sustainability has been on the agenda of our faculty for a long time, for example. It shows up in class, it shows up in, in, uh, in uh, electives. Uh, there was a report published or promoted by the Financial Times recently about uh, the publications that were related to the SDGs. And they looked at 
five years of publication in the FT50 list of journals, and somehow we end up number two. Uh, it's not because my predecessor told them to do it or uh, I told them to do it. It's because they care about uh, uh, that impact. What's happening right now is that we're saying, wait, there is an element there because of the emergency where we need to be more intentional in our collective purpose. So by, by letting all flowers bloom, as it happens, we are already in the domain. We have the research foundation, it's fundamental to who we, who we are. So now it's a question of deciding how, how do we promote this more, maybe in the teaching, uh, but also in the engagement of our alumni uh, and in our operations ourselves. Um, with the next one I mentioned, because we are on business school in London, we have quite a bit of a convening power. And so what responsibility can we take given that opportunity that, that we are? So that's what's happening actually as we speak uh, right now. It's like uh, federating all that's happening. First of all, informing one another about <laughs> all these things that we do at LBS and then bringing some coherence. And we already had some, some uh, philanthropic support. And I believe and I'm working as hard as I can to bring some more uh, to, uh, to help federate and amplify the impact of what we do already. And uh, you mentioned that it's kind of feeding into the classrooms. Mm -hmm. how, how so? Is it, um, mm -hmm. like, is it just individual? Just, but is it the individual faculty mm -hmm. who are kind of putting together uh -huh. portions of the lectures on it, or is there a thought of maybe having sustainability as, a, a, as an elective or mm -hmm. core module? Or? So this is like for every moment in our history where we have evolved, it started with uh, faculty members individually, uh, maybe writing a new case with a new slant to it that, that helps address sustainability issues that you cannot find in all the cases that were written at a different time, for example. Then it continues with faculty working together to shift within the core of their teaching, maybe some of the emphasis, um, shifting the electives. Every year we stop some electives, we start some new one. What has been wonderful is to see some faculty saying, hey, maybe this is a different topic, so maybe we should approach it differently. So, for example, a professor of strategy and professor of finance saying, this is a topic that requires us being coherent together with the students, be a lot more than just an elective in sustainable finance and strategies, right? No, no, let's have the same student look at those topics. So, so that has happened uh, as well. I think what, what's happening next, uh, and it's in the working, is us to be able to tell our students, look, if you're really passionate about this topic, Here's a coherent set of classes and experience you could take that gets you almost like a specialism around sustainability. And then the next step that we need to work on is acknowledging we are a business school by ourselves, but in London, are there competencies that we need to bring into the school uh, to help the future leaders have the full understanding that we think they should have, even if it's not within the research area of our faculty. So we have a good track record of that. When we pushed analytics uh, years ago, we went out and hired people who could help us with artificial intelligence and, and, and uh, big data and bring that expertise. And right now we are at that step of saying, OK, now we're clear as to what we can do individually and together. What is it we need to bring in? Yeah, well, when I was, when I was studying here, um, Return equity was everything. <laughs> like it was, uh -huh. it, you, you almost entirely forgot about, yes. uh, about all other, all other mm -hmm. factors. Um, now, you know, the Sustainable Development Goals and ESG seems to have, you know, mm -hmm. have, have changed the narrative mm -hmm. in, in, mm -hmm. in and around that. Um, how has the school adapted, like moving from a very much kind of finance and equity type, mm -hmm. type model mm -hmm. into taking in more kind of broad ESG notions mm -hmm. of, of, of the world's more interconnected than we thought it was? Uh -huh. yeah. So first, actually, I think when you were taking your classes, they were already organizational behavior classes and strategy classes that were about the more human aspect of leadership and management and uh, the broader aspect of choice. Uh, but maybe as a student, it didn't feel so important. Yeah, we hear that. I think it was more about optimizing, how to better optimize your firm to to emphasize the results that uh -huh. you need to get to get to benefit your equity, your return on equity. Yeah. So it was all connected in, in that way, and rather than look, looking at the kind of okay. broader, yeah. So this was at a time when also the, the rest of the world told those firms that this is what we want from you. And, and there was a hope at the time that this would be enough. Now the question is, where is the failure? And I did my PhD in economics from Minnesota, which is maybe even 
more than Chicago. But even at Minnesota, we recognize that. You know, return equity is not enough because there are a whole bunch of externalities in the world. There is a whole bunch of public goods. And the market will never, ever take care of these things properly. What we've learned over the years is that you can't really just count on the policy makers, the institutional multilateral organization, to actually send the proper market signals to market operators to internalize those externalities and those public goods. And so I think what has shifted over time, and it is true, it took us a while to realize, but not just as business school or business people, I think as, as human beings, it has taken us a while to realize that there is a real responsibility in setting up the environment for firms to perform, while at the same time making sure we manage these firms properly so that they can do the best for us. And we all love how cheap so many things are in relative terms and the rate of innovation that got us out of COVID so fast. Right? But was it fair to ask the companies, oh, and by the way, pay attention to all these things that nah, we're not going to price for you. Yeah, yeah, the, the furniture should be produced in a way that is sustainable, but keep it cheap. <laughs> and so I think that that's where, and what I like about what I see today in the conversation is that there's a greater awareness that business has a role to play, but it cannot by itself solve the crisis. That this is a very much an ecosystem that together needs to evolve. And I often tell students, like, the first thing you need to do when you graduate is vote. Vote and signify to the politicians what is your position? Because if you don't vote, there is no way they can aggregate your perspective. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. F f completely on board with that, yeah. yeah. Vote, um, and also vote with your, um, on the ballot box, but also vote, vote with mm -hmm. your, your pound, your yeah. dollar, or whatever. You know, support the brand, support the products yeah. that, that, that you believe exactly. in. You know, and, and, and so, so you would see in the curriculum definitely that uh, in a context where we realize that purely running a business on, on, uh, with a financial objective, was actually not good for the world, but it wasn't good for the business. Because there's also another element that has become very much alive, is the fact that businesses realize now that, oh, maybe this externality, this pollution, whatever, is not being priced yet. Mm -hmm. But the price, someone is going to knock at the door one day and say it's time to pay. So I might as well get ahead of that. And, and I think those incentives have been and remain powerful. And, and it gives me hope that, yes, businesses We'll make the right decision and we want to create an environment where our students definitely understand. There is maybe one place where uh, there is a next step of evolution that's required of us. Um, it's because in the world we have gotten a bit confused about what is scientific evidence and, and what is not. And uh, I hope we will push uh, that understanding with our students and maybe at Today's world, we, we don't need to do that just with regard to the scientific evidence relative to management, to leadership, strategy, finance, whatever. But it's probably an opportunity for us to be clear about the scientific evidence that's relevant to climate and, and other public goods uh, so that we can help our community assess for themselves because it's not clear where else in the world there is a trusted partner that can uh, bring some of these issues to light. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. there is far too much um politicization of all of these things um, and I think it's, it is entirely fair to say that the way that we've been doing business has brought us down has you know, we haven't priced any externalities mm. and climate is one of mm -hmm. the, one of the reasons one yeah. of the, one of the, the big big fallouts from that and uh, business schools as we kind of grow and evolve um, can have mm -hmm. you know, the, have the ability yeah. to be Teaching people to be thinking about these things as they go into, the, into mm -hmm. their organizations and you know and they they, they grow. And we go back to something we talked about earlier: is teaching our people to ask the, the important questions. Mm -hmm. You know, I really worry today about the fact that from the institutional environment, we are not giving much guidance to business on how how to trade off potential actions across different environmental issues. For example, I was recently talking with a chief strategy officer of a big multinational company that has a big impact on the environment given the nature of their business. They have a big impact on water, on plastics, and on biodiversity because of the nature of their business. This, it's not like they choose to. And they want to improve things. How should they prioritize across water, plastic, and biodiversity? And so right now, the prioritization is very simple. It's based on impact on bottom line. 
It's hard to expect anything else from them. But could it be that, that you know, and, and we saw that finally as a world community we took a stance on biodiversity. But, but this is someone who is really wants to do well and has to choose how to allocate money between my impact on water, on plastics, and on biodiversity. And right now, as a society, as human beings, we are not sending a signal uh, that is meaningful to this chief strategy officer. Mm. And, and so, so I hope that uh, we're going to find a way at some point to help them do the good that they are seeking to do. So I think it would be um, remiss of me to not uh, mm. take the opportunity of uh, picking your, of tapping into your uh, knowledge mm -hmm. uh, from your, your background, your, like mm -hmm. your, your academic background in, in housing economics. Mm -hmm. um, if we were to properly price mm -hmm. um, the cost of climate mm -hmm. to the current housing market, we would probably end up just tanking the entire market and causing mm -hmm. a, a, like a, an unprecedented financial mm -hmm. crisis. But, but we can't just ignore it and hope it goes away because it won't. Like, how can we deal with, with that, with proper pricing of mm -hmm. climate on, on like, the largest sector, financial sector on the planet, mm -hmm. housing and, and property lands? So, so this is why the, I'm so glad it's E and also S and G, right? We have to think about all these factors. It is a big element of uh, climate. It's also a big element of people's lives. Um, and we have to acknowledge that in the past, we haven't paid attention to the E factor. You know, we've allowed cities to develop in floodplains, uh, for example, uh, or big towers to be built on foundations whom we know to be going. So, so we have to pay attention to that element. And actually, if I pull back from this, say what is the most important uh, human element right now when it comes to housing, in particular in this country, is we haven't built enough. And you know, this is something where housing economists, frankly, we're just exhausted, tired, frustrated, angry. How many times can we tell governments that the problem with housing starts with supply. And in particular, I mean, in London, just look around, look at the height, right? And then the green belt. Now, one of my uh, papers is about <laughs> what happens in a world where people can choose where they locate, how much they invest, and how, much, and how they vote. And one of our vote on urban planning. And our fundamental insight <laughs> is that affordability and owner occupancy are two mutually incompatible objectives. And most government, the UK included, trumpet that their objectives are home ownership and affordability. So we have created a system that didn't pay attention to all these externalities and uh, uh, impact on the environment that has become unaffordable with so many owners. And I connect back to the issue that we have relative to now pricing these things properly, is that anything we do that affects the market is going to affect the wealth of so many people who are not ready to be affected in such a meaningful way relative to their wealth. So we are in a real conundrum. The opportunity is that, and, and I don't know how the economists will have better ideas, it starts from first principle, is let's release the right kind of supply we need for the future so that we can facilitate a transition where everyone has access to proper housing <laughs> and, and then make that housing sustainable. And by the way, I mean, it's now pretty clear with the cost of living crisis in this country that insulation matters, right? Look at the stock in the UK, the housing condition is, is uh, terrible. So, so the, the human aspect is important and we have created a problem by pushing so much for home ownership. If that's something that and you find in farmland as well, is land captures the residual value. And everything we do has been capturing this value. This value has been distributed. And the problem that you allude to is the fact that now we realize there was never as much value as we told you there was. Your land is going. And how do we destroy all that wealth? The opportunity is to find ways to create wealth someplace else. I think we've traditionally been very narrowly defining land as really as a factor of production mm -hmm. from, from the economic yes. point of view. Yeah. And, it's, mm -hmm. um, and that, that's been a yeah, you know, it, it's been a second-class citizen to mm -hmm. uh, to capital to mm -hmm. to, to, to yes. labor, um, but land is far more than just a factor of production. Mm -hmm. Like it, it has, um, 
a much deeper impact on, mm -hmm. on, on the world. It has a much mm -hmm. deeper, deeper impact on biodiversity, mm -hmm. on, um, on, on carbon capture. Mm -hmm. um, where do you see the academic thinking on land mm -hmm. going, in, in, particularly in the kind of field, fields of economics? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, the, so you're right to point out that there is something special about land compared to, to capital. Um, and it is true that today we are waking up to the fact that land plays a very important role relative to the uh, climate, for example, relative to uh, biodiversity. And sometimes the use of land that helps us have a healthier life, they are not the use of land that have the highest economic value as defined by the market uh, by itself. There is a way in which the capital one invests into plants it also has some of this feature. We're just waking up to, to land on that. So I don't know if this is the one difference I would emphasize. The difference I would emphasize is that land is fundamentally uh, scarce. Is that there's just so much. Now, you can expand your thinking and say, well, because of planning restrictions. And, but, but in the end, it is what economists we call the residual claimant. It is the one asset that will absorb the value. It goes back to the point that, that we discussed before, is that once we decided that there were these restrictions on building in London, with uh, the green belt around it, with the height restriction, there's just so much land. And the higher performance of London gets reflected into the, uh, the land. What my research contribution was about is to point out that once you take this into account, you create tremendous wealth effects that are heterogeneous across people. You know, the people who, who own their housing today in London, who bought it in the 70s, they are in a very different wealth position than those who bought last year. And, and I don't think we had understood that uh, land, uh, per se, would have this huge impact on wealth distribution, which will then will affect uh, people's uh, perception of what's happening in the world around them and their voting behavior and their purchasing behavior. And so what I see has happened in research is, is that understanding, which, as it happens, mathematically is not easy to capture. But, but now, I mean, there's several of us in the 90s who put that on the table, that there is this distributional impact that comes from that residual claimant aspect of it, and that it's important. I think the research has moved forward to really integrate that into the thinking. And so, for example, a concrete example that I see some of our faculty working on, when you design a policy to green the housing, uh, for example, to promote better insulation or different use of energy, it makes a difference whether it's for the rental sector or for the owner-occupied sector. Because you have a, this, the, the owners sit on different sides of the fence as to the consequence. So that's what's happening in the research, is we are much better at understanding the heterogeneity of people relative to land, and that will allow us to def design better policy that accounts for this heterogeneity. Mm -hmm. It's really hard mathematically, but I was a researcher in the 90s and uh, lots of colleagues have made lots of progress. And I think we're getting better at helping government design policy and when they cannot do the first best, understand how is it that they can maybe organize themselves to still deliver the outcome that they care about. Mm. Um, minded that every year uh, mm -hmm. you speak to large, uh -huh. large co co cohorts of graduates yes. and you um, put them out into the world. Mm -hmm. um, what piece of advice do you most commonly give to, mm -hmm. to, to people, to graduating students? So, so, so first of all, I'm even more excited about that than about research, because this is the best moment in the life of a dean, is, is giving the graduation speech and sending them off. So thank you for asking about that. Um, every year I try to have a different message based on my understanding of the class and what's happened to us all. And, and this year I wanted to leave them with a question. A question that was so essential to us as we went through the pandemic, because it was hard on the school. We lost a third of our revenues when Heathrow shut down. And, and I like the fact that before the crisis, we had been clear with ourselves as to whom do we serve. And I mentioned the alumni. And, and that we had to retrench our allocation of resources, but we serve the alumni. Right? So whatever we do, we got to keep that in mind. And I thought for the class that graduated last year, and because we caught up in graduation with the two classes that graduated during the pandemic, that that was the, the message of the moment. It's like, ask yourself, as you go on with the rest of your life, whom do you serve? Whom do you serve? And ask me in a year what is my <laughs> question for <laughs> this year. But 
whom do you serve? Take the time to ponder and be clear about that. Very good, yeah. And last question. Um, would you have, I know we've been talking quite a lot about, about, about climate and the, mm -hmm. you know, the, the difficulties, the challenges mm -hmm. uh, ahead of us and you know, some, mm -hmm. how, how hard it's hitting some, some communities. Mm -hmm. uh, but also there's uh, the, the work that's being done and the, you know, the, the, the positivity mm -hmm. about you know, how, how we might be able to make a change. Uh, would you have a kind of a note of optimism that uh, you know to, mm -hmm. to, to talk about you know from from kind of works and school and community uh -huh. that's what we should be taking in mind in, in the world of climate? Uh, three, the researchers have been on these questions for a long time, and and there is so much to learn from them, starting with the questions that they ask, the insights they generate, the perspective they shed light on, so that. That's one. Um, number two is I see how passionate so many of our students are around these issues. And now they are driving us to evolve and driving uh, themselves through their clubs and uh, events that they uh, organize. Uh, and third, I want to finish with a compliment. We have alumni like you, <laughs> right? We are taking the research into the conversation. And if you go back over the conversation we have had, it's like, this is fundamental to progress for all of us. It's like, thank you for engaging our researchers and, and shedding light off. Yes, yeah, some of the things, you know, like we disagree among one another. I mean, I love the fact that people say, oh, economists, you know, they don't agree with each other. No, you know, there's some things actually we do. And a lot of this research, you know, if I let go of the glass, it's gonna go down. And there's a lot more we know about the world than just about gravity. And you are helping take some of these insights into the world. And so, so you know, if as a school, I can see our researchers, our students, our alumni engaging uh, together, then LBS, we are doing our job. And, and we will have that profound impact on the way the world does business and impact squared, right? The, on the way business impacts the world. And, and that gives me optimism and, and that's why I love my job. Fantastic, fantastic. I'm going to be doing a lot of thinking about who I serve. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you so much for that, Francois. Thank you. Really, really fantastic uh, thank conversation. You very much. Yeah, really. Well, thank you very much for uh, joining us on that conversation. Uh, we hope that you enjoyed it. Uh, we hope that you uh, learned something. Uh, if you did enjoy it, please feel free to leave a five-star review and uh, to subscribe to, uh, to any of our channels. And uh, we'll be sure to keep you updated on future productions. This series is produced by United Renewables in collaboration with the London Business School Alumni Energy Club.